Okay. So just at the end, then we will do the. You will just read me the questions. Sounds fine. Yes. Sounds fine. Yes. So as the questions come, I'll keep on uh, um, what you say, uh, compiling them and going through them, and in the end, I'll okay. ask you. Okay. Fine. So Sounds just great. At the end, Sounds then great. we will do the. You will just read me the questions. Sounds fine. Yes. Sounds fine. Yes. So as the questions come, I'll keep on uh, um, what you say, uh, compiling them and going through them, and in the end, I'll okay. ask you. Welcome everybody. My name is uh, Abhay, and uh, I am I am very glad to have you all on board. Samir, are you able to hear me? Okay, now we are going to start Samir. One, two, three, start. Okay. Welcome everybody. My name is uh, Abhay. Welcome everybody. My name is Abhay, and I am glad to invite you everybody to this special session of Kabul Mandal. And I'm glad our old friend Henry is back with us and. Uh, we are very happy to see Henry after so long time. He had been with us at uh, our observation sky observation at Neral, and we really enjoyed the outing with him. And uh, it was a really good time, great time with him. Uh, for all those who don't know, Kabul Mandal is a uh, is a non-governmental organization, and we do astronomy since 1985. We are popularizing astronomy for last 35 years, and uh, during this lockdown due to coronavirus, we are. We started with an online course, which had extremely good response. And now we are continuing with uh, various invited talks. Kagol Mandal, we meet every Wednesday at Sadhana Vidyalaya, but nowadays we don't meet because of the uh, situation in the country. We meet at Nashik, and that too also on Sundays, but nowadays this is closed. If you want some information from us, please go to kagolmandal.com or else contact either of us on email or phone. That's for sky shows, for slide shows, for lecture series, for everything that you wish. This is the website of Kabul Mandal, the Facebook page of Kabul Mandal. These are the various activities that we keep on doing. You can see on the top left is Dr. Chitre. We had an interview with him. We published a book recently named Astarangan. We do this kind of rural sky shows. This We go all over the country with telescopes, and these are almost free of cost programs around the a country once from October up to May, student special, the courses, and of course, the most popular are the overnight sky sessions. We are having quite many publications, and these publications are available. Tarangan, it's a complete sky guide to the night sky. It's a 300 page book recently published by Kabul Mandal. Tarangan is available also in Marathi. Kabul Bishwa is our latest uh, quarterly magazine, that's e magazine right now, and these are the color sky map. Those are available to all of you. So we can go to kagalmandal.com and see what we are doing, what we are publishing, and please feel free to connect with us. With this small introduction to Kagal Mandal, I hand over the uh, mic to uh, Dr. Sujata Deshpande, who will be the host for the night, and we'll quickly start with our discussions. Over to you, Sujata. Okay, thank you very much, Abhay. And I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Henry Throop on Kabul Mandal's online platform today. He is joining us from across the globe with a time difference of about 10 and a half hours. So a very good morning to you, Henry, and good evening uh -huh. to the audience. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Henry Throop to you. Uh, he is a astronomer at uh, uh, he is an astronomer at NASA USA. He has done his PhD in planetary science from University of Colorado. His research focuses on outer solar system, and he has published over 40 papers in various uh, prestigious research journals. The topic of his publications are varied, and they include rings of Saturn, Jupiter, formation of planets and star, astrobiology, and most importantly, uh, the search and co-discovery of Pluto's smallest moon, Styx. He is a member of the team that works on NASA's New Horizons mission, about which he is going to talk to us today. Uh, Henry is also involved very actively in bringing astronomy to masses. 
He has given more than 150 lectures at different festivals, planetaria, schools, various public events on different topics of astronomy. And during his eight year stay in South Africa, Mexico and India, he has given numerous lectures on astronomy. He has interacted with local students and community groups like one of them is Kabul Mandal. And he is an expert photographer also. For his fantastic work in research as well as science communication, he has been honored with US State Department's Avis Bolhan Award and American Astronomical Society's Carl Sagan Medal. Wow. Okay, an asteroid has been named in his honor and it is called as 193736 Henry Through. So we have here with us a very global and a versatile personality. Uh, Dr. Henry Throop. Before I hand over the screen to him, I request all the participants to post your questions only on the chat session. Please post only the question on the chat session. Don't pass on any personal message or don't carry out the discussion over there. And keep your mics mute and your videos off. Now over to you, Henry. Once again, welcome. And I give you all the screen. Thank you, Sajada. Thank you, Abhay, for the uh, for the for the welcome here. Uh, let's see. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, may you confirm that you can see my screen here? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Thank you so much for having me here. It's such a uh, such a pleasure. I. Uh, the three years that I spent in uh, living in Bombay are some of the some of the best that I've ever had. I think Bombay is the greatest city in the world, and I'm uh, so happy to be uh, with you, even virtually, right now today. Uh, one of the best uh, times that I that I did have, in truth, was uh, coming out to the Kegel Mandal nighttime session. Uh, here we are on the uh, on the Bombay local, coming out with some of my students from St. Xavier's College. Uh, and uh, uh, coming out to the nighttime session. And of course, the wonderful uh, uh, nighttime lectures, uh, all the students, um, all of, the, uh, all of the, the, the good food. I've never, never been to a nighttime star party exactly like Kago Mondal. Uh, it was amazing. It's uh, probably my, my, my favorite nighttime star party ever. And I hope that uh, uh, many other people can, ex can continue to experience it decades in the future, just like uh, you have. So uh, it's uh, such an incredible experience that uh, you are giving to, uh, to the world of, of India and the students and, and, and others. So, um, so uh, I'm happy to uh, be there and I hope I will be able to return again. I'm going to talk about the New Horizons mission. This is a spacecraft which is uh, going through our solar system right now. And uh, just for context, I want to just back up and uh, uh, put out so we have a, a galaxy here. Um, our sun is, of course, just one of the many, many stars uh, in our galaxy. Uh, here we have um, at the center of the sun, the center of the solar system, we have the sun. And uh, then as we go out, we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Uh, the rocky planets. Then we have, uh, as we go further out, we have, uh, we call these the rocky planets because they are uh, planets which are more or less like, uh, like ours, made of, made of rocks, you can stand on them. They're about the same size. As we go further out, we have Jupiter and then Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. We call these planets the gas giant planets because they're largely made of hydrogen and helium gas. And uh, then we have, so we, we have this class of planets. We're getting colder as we're getting further from the sun because all of the energy, all the heat from the, uh, in the solar system comes from the sun. So we're getting colder as we go further out through the solar system. Then we have Pluto, of course, out beyond the orbit of, of uh, Neptune. But Pluto is not the end of the solar system. In fact, we're just starting to get uh, to the edge of the solar system. Um, there's many, many more things out beyond Pluto and even out beyond this as well. So we have um, a whole class of objects called Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, and all these are small and icy. Um, what we, uh, if you take the atmosphere in the room that you're in right now, uh, it's made of nitrogen, it's made of uh, water vapor, it's made of carbon dioxide, uh, it's made of oxygen. And, and if you take all these and you move it, move the room that you are in right now out to the distance of Pluto, then all of those gases in your, in your room would turn into uh, solids, would turn into ice, say a layer a couple of millimeters thick in your, uh, in your room. And so that's what 
uh, that's what happens at Pluto is that all the gases turn to turn to ice. So we have these three classes of planets in the solar system, the rocky planets, the gas giant planets, and the icy planets, based on the distance from the sun and the temperature that it is out there. Now, when we lived in Bombay, I lived in, uh, lived in Car West. And uh, this, is the, this is the view from my flat there. Um, and uh, you can see up in the, uh, this is one time about, uh, about four years ago where you can see the sun just starting to come up. Also, you can see the moon, Venus, Mercury, and of course, Earth all at the same time. Mars and Jupiter were in the sky too. So we had almost all the visible planets in the sky. Uh, we could not see Saturn was the only one uh, not up then. Um, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and the asteroids are too faint to be seen by naked eye. You must use a telescope to see them. Uh, but people have been using, looking at the planets, uh, even from bright cities like Bombay for thousands of years. So I want to put the, uh, put the uh, discovery of Pluto in a little bit of context. In 1874, there's a French astronomer, Urbain Le Verrier, and he was looking at the orbit of, uh, of Uranus and, and saw that the orbit of Uranus was not exactly following the path that he predicted it would. It would follow a, a Keplerian path in the sky, an ellipse, mathematical ellipse. And he saw there were some deviations from this ellipse. And so he calculated it out and he predicted that the deviations were caused by the gravity of another planet. And he worked out and he predicted there was another planet called Neptune. And he predicted that Neptune would be over here in the sky. He did his calculations. He uh, talked with his colleague who had a telescope and uh, they found Neptune essentially the next day. So this is one of the most remarkable discoveries in astronomy where he predicted the location of Neptune and then found it the next day uh, in the sky. That was in 1874. Uh, uh, 30 years later, astronomer Percival Lowell in the United States. Percival Lowell was kind of like the Tata of, um, of uh, the US. He was a big industrialist at the time, but he was doing good. He was uh, looking at the position of Neptune and he was like, oh, I think the position of Neptune is being pulled by another planet. So he called this planet, planet X, for X being the unknown. And he started a search for another planet. And he predicted it should be over here. And he looked over there and it wasn't there. So uh, he searched around for more, for longer, and then he died. And uh, he died without, without having found anything yet. Before he died, he hired another astronomer named Clyde Tombaugh. Clyde Tombaugh came across the United States and started working at Lowell Observatory uh, to search for planet X. And what he did is this. He used this telescope here, this 13 inch discovery telescope, a very wide angle telescope. And he took pictures of the sky. Now we know we have a constellation in the sky. We have, let's say, Orion. And Orion rises and the shape of its stars is fixed as it passes overhead. And then the next day it rises again and the shape of its stars is fixed again, the pattern in, of the stars. So if we see, and this happens for thousands of years with no change to the pattern of the stars. So if we see anything move against the stars, we know that it's not a star. We know it's something in our solar system. It could be a planet, it could be an asteroid, it could be a comet, we know it's something different. So if we just take a picture of the stars and then we take another picture a week later and we see something that's moved, that's something in our solar system. So Percival Lowell uh, and Clyde Tombaugh used this trick to try to uh, search for the outer planets. So here's one picture. Here's the next picture. I'm just blinking back and forth between these. And here, if you look really closely, you can see, well, I'll circle it here. Right there is a discovery image of Pluto. And on the next frame, it moves to over here. So these are the first two pictures that uh, uh, were, were taken in this discovery sequence of Pluto, where about one week later, it's moved across a portion of the sky here. Now this is back in 1930. Uh, and what you could tell then is not very much. You could tell that, that Pluto takes, it, we know that Pluto is moving very slowly across the sky and you can measure actually, first of all, Lowell, or Clyde Tombaugh measured how slowly it was moving across the sky. Uh, from its, from its uh, orbital speed, you can tell its distance just using Kepler's laws. From its distance, you can predict its temperature. Um, and, but besides that, there wasn't much, uh, much that was known about it. You can't tell, for instance, its diameter because it's too small, it's unresolved. And so even in the largest telescope at the time, it was unresolved, meaning that you cannot uh, uh, tell what its actual diameter is or its mass. Um, so not much was known about Pluto for, since uh, from 1930 until, uh, until later. Um, Later, meaning in this case, 1976, there's an astronomer named 
uh, Jim Christie, taking observations in the US, the US Naval Observatory. And here's a picture that he saw of Pluto. And then three days later, he took another picture and he saw there was, there was a little blob, a little um, blip on the top and it's moved to the bottom. Now, most of what you see there is noise. That fuzzy white background is just noise. But what you see in the center is Pluto. And there's a little blob on top, which moves to the bottom three days later. And what he predicted, well, first it looked like it was just a mountain of Pluto, but then it turned out the mountain would be too big. It wouldn't work dynamically. And so what he uh, said it was, was a new moon of Pluto. In fact, uh, this is correct. This is the moon named Charon. And, it's, and it takes three days to go about half around Pluto. It takes 6.5 days to go all the way around Pluto. And in fact, from Charon's, mat, from Charon's orbital period, now you can determine the distance and the mass of Pluto. In those pictures, those are the discovery images and you could not resolve Pluto. But here, uh, in this image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, this is the best picture that we've ever taken from Earth of Pluto. And there you have Pluto on the left and Charon on the right. And each of them is about one pixel across. Charon is less than a pixel across. This is the best picture that you can, that you can see from the, uh, from, from the Earth of Pluto and Charon. That was in 1978 uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is the highest resolution space telescope uh, that we have on, on Earth. Um, you can see uh, two additional moons named Nix and Hydra that were discovered in 2006. Then in 2011, we discovered one more moon called Kerberos. And then uh, I was part of the group in 2012 that discovered the moon named Styx. Uh, Styx is the smallest moon in the, in the Pluto system. That Pluto is about a thousand kilometers across. Uh, Charon is about half that. Uh, Nix, Kerberos, Hydra, and Styx are on the order of uh, 10 or 20 kilometers across, so very small. So if you put everything that we know about Pluto on one slide, you can list it here. Pluto's, you can list Pluto's radius. We can measure that from the Hubble Space Telescope, from its orbital period uh, of, of Charon going around it. You can, you can uh, guess its uh, size and its mass, and thus its composition. Uh, we know it has a very thin atmosphere and five moons going around it, but it's so small that we could not uh, see any surface features. We couldn't learn anything about the geology. We couldn't learn anything about its history or formation or features or anything like that. Any exploration now over this requires a close-up visit. Now, how do we visit things close up? If we have a bigger and bigger telescope, we can, uh, we can see higher and higher resolution. So with the, um, the largest telescope on Earth, is one of these 10 meter class telescopes, like the, uh, the very large telescope, the VLT in, uh, in Chile, or the Keck telescopes, so 10 or 11 meters. We can build a bigger and bigger telescope, uh, but it becomes harder and harder to bigger, big, build a bigger and bigger telescope. On the other hand, there's, some, there's a nice trick that we can use. We can just take a small telescope and move that small telescope to the thing we're looking at. Now you can only do this in the solar system. You can't fly a small telescope to the stars. You can't fly it to another galaxy, but in the solar system, it just takes a couple of years to fly across the solar system. And so you can observe Pluto from a spacecraft using a tiny telescope very close. That's what we did at NASA. That's what we did with the New Horizons spacecraft. Here's a spacecraft right here. This is a 5,000 crore project funded by NASA and operated by a group called the APL, the Applied Physics Laboratory and SWRI, Southwest Research Institute. This is about the size of a, of a rickshaw, um, of an auto. Uh, you can fit maybe you know, three people inside an auto, but of course on this, this is entirely a robotic spacecraft and so there's no people allowed uh, on the spacecraft. Uh, that's much better. We've done really well with, with uh, robotic exploration of the solar system. Uh, we don't want people here because then we have to take along food and so forth. It's much better to explore the outer solar system with robots than with people. So, so the job of the spacecraft is just to take pictures of Pluto, send them back over the radio. Um, it doesn't land, it doesn't orbit Pluto, it doesn't come back to the Earth, it just takes pictures and sends them back. Uh, if you look at the components of it, it has three components, main parts on it. It has a, a camera, in fact, it has a couple of different cameras, one for optical light, one for infrared light, and so forth. Uh, it, has a, uh, it has a radio and has a battery. So this is essentially the same as uh, just a mobile that you have with you. Nice uh, iPhone 11 here. Um, different cameras. Uh, we have a larger camera. We have a larger battery. We have a more powerful radio, but it's the same idea that you click a pic and you send it and it gets sent back over the radio link and then uh, you can see it on Earth. 
Now here's a zoom of the of the uh, spacecraft itself. This is about two meters across, two and a half meters for the main mirror. And I've identified all of the instruments here. At the bottom, we have the visible light imager. So this is just like a CCD with a uh, with an eight inch um, aperture that you would have out of the nighttime observation session. Uh, we have the in, the in an infrared imager on the right. We have an ultraviolet spectrometer on the right also. And so the ultraviolet spectrometer studies the emissions from Pluto's atmosphere. The infrared spectrometer studies the emissions from Pluto's surface. We also have instruments to look at the solar wind and the charged particle environment. So this tells us about Pluto's atmosphere as it escapes by actually measuring these particles, just like it's just like with your nose, you measure the particles that are entering your nose. Um, Pluto's uh, sensors do this as well. Also in the bottom, we have what's called the student dust counter. This is an instrument built by students at the University of Colorado. And uh, this is a, uh, a piezoelectric circuit which measures impacts by dust particles onto the spacecraft. So this tells us about the environment of not how many big particles like planets there are in the solar system, but it tells us about the dust environment of the solar system because this tells us a lot about the history of the formation of the planets by looking at the dust. Now our spacecraft uh, was conceived back in the 1990s when scientists had the idea of sending a mission to Pluto. Uh, it took a long time to uh, assemble a team, come up with some good ideas. Uh, in 2001, NASA had a competition and our mission was selected for flight. And then we had about four years to construct and build it until it was ready for testing in uh, the end of 2005. We launched uh, then in, in uh, 2006 from Florida. slide has just stopped moving here. There it is. Here we go. So here in 2002, we were uh, constructing the spacecraft. Uh, this is made of a, uh, uh, mostly of aluminum, which is very strong and lightweight. Um, here is uh, some of the technicians building the infrared spectrometer. Uh, this is the main aperture where the light enters. And uh, then up top is the radiator. The radiator just keeps it cool so that we can uh, measure without contamination because we want to keep the electronics cool. Uh, this person is wearing a, uh, a mask, not because of coronavirus, uh, but because of uh, we want to uh, reduce contamination on the spacecraft because this is looking at the composition of the molecules on the surface of Pluto. We don't want it to be uh, uh, finding out that the surf, that Pluto's composition is made of the same things like fingerprints and hair, uh, which would be contaminated in, in the lab. So we keep it clean. Here the technicians are installing the, uh, the high gain antenna on top, this two and a half meter antenna and the, uh, the various wiring harnesses for the spacecraft. Like this picture, this is a, like the, uh, like the uh, doctors with their baby here. And then we spin test the spacecraft because the spacecraft is rotating while it's in flight at some points. And so we wanna make sure that it's balanced just like the wheel on a car, it has to be balanced properly. So it takes a long, large team to assemble this, uh, assemble this spacecraft and fly it. At the center there in black is Dr. Alan Stern, who's the principal investigator of the mission at the Southwest Research Institute. Uh, behind him are uh, members of the science team, members of the engineering team, and the other people who are involved with the mission. Uh, it takes about uh, 2,000 people who were involved with the mission overall in total. Uh, many of those are scientists, many of them are engineers, some of them are writers, some of them are programmers, uh, some of them are technicians. Uh, some of them are uh, 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 optical engineers and so forth. So it's many, many different people from many different fields uh, to work on this. Uh, there's a number of people who are from, from India uh, who've been involved with the mission um, and a number of people from, from around the world. It's a US-based mission, but uh, it really takes people from around the world to, uh, to, to work on missions like these. So when I was started working on this, the spacecraft was uh, uh, Parts of the spacecraft were built in Boulder, Colorado, in the center there with all the mountains. Uh, then we took the spacecraft down to, uh, down to Texas where other parts of the spacecraft were built. Uh, it was assembled at the Goddard Space Flight Center outside of Washington, Washington DC. And it was launched from uh, the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral in Florida on the bottom right. Uh, this is the same launch site that uh, you saw the SpaceX uh, uh, Dragon capsule assembled for launch at yesterday. So at Cape Canaveral in early 2006, January of 2006, uh, this is, a, uh, uh, this is a, an Atlas V launch vehicle 
the, what you see there is the nose cone is where New Horizons is in right now um, at this launch. And then you can see the main rocket with its booster rockets strapped onto the side. So the main rocket is uh, liquid fueled. It's kerosene essentially, but if you're in space, kerosene doesn't burn because you need oxygen. So you need to take along your own oxygen. So there's essentially two large fuel tanks in here, one carrying oxygen and one carrying kerosene because you need to take your own oxygen along. Uh, then there's also solid rockets, which are uh, uh, which are uh, strapped onto the side, and those give extra thrust just at the beginning of the launch. Now the the launch vehicle doesn't run; it takes nine and a half years to get out to Pluto. But the rocket doesn't run for nine and a half years. The rocket only runs for less than one hour. Uh, it burns up essentially all of its fuel in that one hour, and by the end of an hour, then the spacecraft, New Horizons itself, has been ejected and is moving on a course directly toward Pluto. And the rest of the trajectory for the next nine and a half years is an unpowered cruise toward Pluto. It's just gliding through space. So it's just like a bowling ball. You know, if you push the bowling ball, you give it a push and then you let it cruise. And as long as you've pushed it in the right direction, it's going to get to its target. Now we can steer it a little bit as we go along, but it has to be going in essentially the right direction um, by, the, by the end of the launch. So here we are as the rocket is uh, being prepared for launch. Here we are at uh, Cape Canaveral. Now you can see the launch pad is at the center, is at the center on the left there. It's very small because we're about uh, maybe 10 kilometers away from it. On the far right is the vehicle assembly building at Cape Canaveral. If anybody has, has been there, that's where the Saturn V and the space shuttle were assembled. And then the launch pad is on the left. Uh, the Cape Canaveral is at a, at a wildlife refuge. So there's many alligators there. Uh, really exciting time to be out there with all of the people watching the launch. And here's the launch itself. Uh, I'll show a short little, short little video of it as well, but a really exciting day to, uh, to see the launch go off successfully. Uh, this is one of the astronomers on the mission as we're seeing the uh, plume of the rocket going up into space. This is one of the geologists on the mission. It's a very emotional time for everybody. One of the artists on the mission. And here's the launch itself. T minus one minute. So you can see those are lightning rods because we don't want lightning hitting the spacecraft when it's full of oxygen and fuel. So this is not a reusable launch vehicle. Uh, what SpaceX is doing with re reusable launch vehicles is fantastic. T minus 18 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So this is so exciting as the vehicle takes off from the Florida coast. That only takes about 30 seconds for it to get out of view from us on the ground. So we're following it here with, uh, with telescopes and with, uh, with uh, cameras on airplanes. You can see the strap on boosters burning. Now these uh, solid rocket boosters on the side there, those are gonna burn out because they have burnt uh, most of their fuel now. Once they've burnt their fuel up, there's no point in carrying them along. So they're gonna be ejected. Uh, once they're empty of fuel. And then it's just going to be the main liquid engines, the oxygen and the kerosene, which continue to burn. SRBs are the solid rocket boosters. So 
So the solid rocket boosters are about to be ejected. The RD-180s, that's our main liquid engine made in Russia. So these uh, solid rockets are now falling back into the ocean. They recovered, but they are not reused. So we are far downwind from where we started and it's gonna to continue to bed till about 40, for another 40 minutes of uh, burning until the spacecraft is put on its way toward a trajectory toward Pluto. Now, if you uh, are driving, trying to get to the moon, maybe the fastest that you could uh, drive, if you have a nice fast car here, uh, driving in a Ferrari at 250 kph, it would take you about a year to get to the moon. The Apollo missions took about four days to get to the moon. Uh, our spacecraft, New Horizons, it got to the distance of the moon in just nine hours, going 10 times faster than the Apollo mission. Now, how does it do that? It's just, it's just physics, because we have much lower mass, so we have much higher velocity. It's, uh, it's cheating. That's why, we, um, that's, why we, uh, that's why we don't take people along on our spacecraft, because it uh, takes a lot more weight to, to take people along. So this is the fastest spacecraft which has ever launched from the Earth. So we launched in January in 2006. 2007, we passed Jupiter. And then 2008, 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Finally, in 2015, we got to Pluto. So it's a nine year cruise until we get to Pluto. We essentially, we took a straight line. We left the earth, passed Jupiter, passed the orbit of Saturn and Jupiter, Saturn and, and uh, Uranus. Um, we didn't we go past those planets, past the orbit until we encountered Pluto in July of 2015. Let me just show you a couple of pictures from what we saw at Jupiter. We had a Jupiter flyby just a year after, after launch. This is the highest resolution global image of Jupiter which has ever been taken. Uh, here you see the great red spot and you see the, uh, the atmospheric structure in Jupiter's uh, beautiful atmosphere. This is Jupiter's ring. Now, Jupiter's ring is a lot smaller and a lot fainter than Saturn's famous rings. Uh, but it, uh, it's made of dust, small dust particles, which are orbiting right next to the moons. This is the moon Adrastea and the moon Metis, which are orbiting within the rings. And uh, the, the moons essentially make the dust particles and they, uh, uh, and they sustain the dust particles there. The dust particles are in orbit around the planet. Here's a short movie, which is showing the volcano, uh, the volcano rich uh, moon named Io. Uh, Io is in an orbit around Jupiter. You can see Io, uh, it's uh, very easily with a, uh, with a small telescope. I suspect that most of you have seen Io before. Um, you can see Jupiter's moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto um, in, uh, in almost any small telescope. Io is great because it's right next to Jupiter. It's being pulled by Jupiter's gravity, put, pushed and pulled, pushed and pulled. And that causes a lot of heat in its interior as the heat tries to escape from Io uh, that causes volcanism. And the volcanism is what you see here with sulfur and sodium being put up into a plume which leaves Io and then uh, falls back onto its surface. So we had a nine year cruise through the solar system before we get to Pluto. What are we doing there? Are we just flying? Are we just uh, falling asleep? Not really, because we knew that we just had one chance to go past Pluto and uh, uh, we couldn't turn around. We couldn't redo it if we missed it. So everything we did was about making sure that we uh, had a successful encounter with Pluto. So um, all of our Observation sequence was pre-programmed. Uh, so we wanted to study Pluto as best we could from the ground and figure out where we should, where we should target on Pluto, uh, program a sequence to tell our spacecraft exactly what images to take where. And we wanted to optimize these to get the best, very best science observations that we could given our fast flyby of Pluto. We're flying, flying past, fast Pluto uh, very quickly. We can't observe all of it, but we want to take the best science that we can uh, during our one chance to go past Pluto. So we spent this time uh, planning our observation sequence, um, calibrating the instruments, testing the uh, sequence, testing the spacecraft, and uh, so forth for this nine-year cruise. My involvement with the mission, um, before launch, I was involved with uh, calibrating, testing the infrared spectrometer. I was involved with writing a lot of the software, uh, tools to plan the observations, looking for dust on our, on our path, uh, planning observations of rings and small moons. Uh, both uh, uh, that we're going to observe at Pluto. Now, something interesting happened here. When we were selected for launch, 
uh, Pluto had just one new known moon, which is Chiron. And then just before launch, we found two new moons, Nix and Hydra. And then after launch, we found two more moons, uh, Kerberos and Styx. And so it's kind of like you have five missions for the price of one, because there's all this new, all these new moons to go to go see in the Pluto system. It's a much richer environment. But there's a problem with that too. And uh, well, here's the problem. Um, if there's more moons around Pluto, uh, more moons could mean that there's more dust. Because I showed you this picture of Jupiter where you have all this, all these, uh, uh, we have the ring of, of Jupiter, which is made of dust. And that's at the same location as all these, as, all, as the moons of Jupiter. And uh, the same thing could happen at Pluto. And we're moving very, very quickly. We're going about 30,000 kilometers per hour. And a dust particle, which is just one millimeter across, can end the mission if, you, if we were to impact at, at 30,000 kilometers per hour. So uh, if there's all these new moons there, that could be dust, that could be dangerous. So is it even safe to go past Pluto at all? So we were actually on the team. We were extremely worried about this. Is it actually safe to fly past Pluto now that we've been discovering all these new moons? So an individual dust particle that's a millimeter across is too small to see. We, couldn't, we can't plan for, to avoid an, an, an individual dust particle. But what, what we could do is plan and see if there are uh, uh, clouds of dust, if there's regions of dust at Pluto where uh, uh, dust accumulates and would be unsafe to fly through or particularly safe to fly through. So we did a lot of uh, observations and modeling and testing to, uh, to predict whether there were some safe or unsafe regions at Pluto. In the end, after all of our work during cruise, we concluded that it was safe to go past Pluto and that uh, we could uh, continue with our, with our encounter as planned. This is good. That's the whole job of the spacecraft is to go past Pluto. So we were very happy that it would actually be safe to do so. So fly, on this nine-year trajectory, we were flying by early 2015. Uh, we've flown most of the 6 billion kilometers to get to Pluto. Now, we have a small aperture. Our aperture is just 10 inches, 8 or 10 inches across. Uh, that's a much smaller aperture than, say, the Hubble Space Telescope at 2.4 meters across. And so we weren't observing Pluto the whole time. In fact, we couldn't even see Pluto the whole time because at the beginning, we were just too far away to easily see Pluto. So, uh, but by the time that we were about 90% of the way there, suddenly, finally, Pluto was getting brighter because we we're getting closer, so we could actually see it easily. Uh, so this is the first image that we uh, that we uh, released from from Pluto. Here we have Pluto and its moon Charon. And then there, this looks about like that first Hubble image that I showed you, where you can see them. They're pretty small, but they are resolved. And then they're getting bigger every day. We're getting closer to Pluto, and so these images are getting bigger and bigger. Here we have a movie of Charon and Pluto orbiting each other around their common barycenter. That's why it's sometimes called the dual planet system because they're orbiting each other. You can't see the other small moons here yet, but uh, pretty soon we were able to see them as well. So our encounter was targeted for uh, July 15th, July 14th, 2015. So every day we're getting closer and closer. Our images keep getting bigger and bigger until they disappeared. So this is July 4th, 2015. Uh, we were searching for, we were uploading commands to the spacecraft. In fact, we were uploading the final command sequence to the spacecraft and then the spacecraft disappeared. Uh, we were tracking it with our deep space network of uh, 80 meter uh, radio dishes and suddenly the spacecraft just vanished. There's no signal from it at all found. Sometimes this happens when there's a, when there's a rainstorm or when there's a tracking error, there's a power outage. So we called up the antennas to see like, is there a problem? What's going on? And they were like, nope, the spacecraft has just vanished. We have no idea where it is. So uh, we, we searched around. About four hours later, we actually found the spacecraft. It was transmitting on a backup frequency and it was very confused. It didn't know uh, what had happened. So this is just kind of like if you've lost a friend, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're walking around and you, you're, you don't know where your friend is. You might, you might uh, send them a WhatsApp like, hey, where are you? Where are you? Uh, and eventually they'll send you a message back like, oh, I'm over here. Um, you know, where am I? And so, 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 you know, you send some messages back and forth until you figure out what's going on. Um, but we didn't want to send too many messages back and forth because every time we send a message to the spacecraft, it takes four hours for our message to go to the spacecraft and it has to think about it. And then it sends a, a message back to us. And four hours later, we get that. We're only 10 days before we're supposed to get to Pluto. And so every hour can make a critical difference in uh, whether we're able to recover and fly past Pluto or not. So we sent a couple of messages back and forth until we figured out what the problem was. 
Um, and uh, luckily in charge of our mission operations is Alice Bowman here. So she and her team were able to figure out what was going on with the spacecraft. Uh, we had overloaded its uh, CPU essentially. We were asking it to do too much and it had rebooted uh, while we were uploading new commands to it. So this is essentially uh, kind of like, you know, if you have your phone and you uh, upgrade the operating system on it and then you unplug the power as you're upgrading the operating system on it, that's what we did to our spacecraft. And we did that uh, to our spacecraft without ever testing this from 6 billion kilo kilometers away. So this is um, uh, something that we, of course, did not intend to do because we have this great engineering team. We were able to figure out what went on, uh, solve this problem, and uh, make sure that it wasn't going to happen again. So we had to rewrite some of the system software, test this new software on the ground, and reprogram the spacecraft for the first time from 6 billion kilometers away. It took us two days. Uh, nobody slept. And luckily, after that, we were back on track. And the images started coming back down again. Very exciting. July 8th. July 9th, July 12th. So July 14th is the Pluto flyby day. And what's gonna happen here on, on our closest approach is uh, at three o'clock in the morning, that's when we receive our, our highest gl resolution global image of Pluto. At about 7.50 in the morning is when the time when we actually approach Pluto the closest. And the spacecraft is not transmitting all of its pictures at the same time it's taking it. In fact, spacecraft can only do one thing at a time because they can only point at one place at a time. Um, so we've programmed the spacecraft to take pictures of Pluto all day long. So it takes thousands of pictures of Pluto as it's going past it. And it can, it's autonomous. It, we've programmed it exactly which pictures to take in what modes of what area of the planet. And, uh, and then we want to hear from the spacecraft just to uh, just take, have we told the spacecraft to take a break from its observation sequence at about 8 p.m. Uh, to send us a signal that it, uh, if it had successfully taken pictures or not. And so the real critical moment here is at 8 p.m. when we receive this signal. So here we are in the, in the hotel. There were um, about uh, 200 scientists and engineers staying in this hotel, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, here we are in the morning with the uh, crew from Discovery TV, who's watching some of the uh, scientists and engineers and students come out. Here we are at 6 o'clock in the morning. And so this, these are the scientists and engineers here. And we are about to see the first the first global image from Pluto. So this is what we've been waiting for nine years to see. Let's see it. And here we are. Wow, wow. So this is the first image that we saw uh, from, from Pluto. This isn't at all what, what I think any of us thought that it would look like. It was, it's bizarre. What's bizarre about it? So. Um, you see that there's a whole variety of different, of different landforms on it. Um, there's regions which are really, really dark on the, on the left there, dark brown. This is essentially a true color. This is what Pluto would look like if you were standing in front of it yourself. Uh, up on top, there's, uh, there's regions which are a little bit brownish. There's regions which have craters on them, but there's a lot of regions which don't have craters on them at all. Uh, and then there's this one big area, kind of whitish in the center there. It looks like a heart. And that's because we love Pluto and Pluto loves us too. Now, if you compare the image of Pluto with say the image, an image of the moon, which you've, uh, many of you have seen the t in the telescope, uh, it looks really, really different. The moon is covered with craters. In fact, we call the moon is saturated with craters because if you, you can't even fit any more craters on the moon. If you put another crater on the moon, then you cover up some of the old craters. And so this is, the, the moon is kind of like a, uh, you know, it's been hit. These craters are caused by asteroids and caused by comets, which impact into the surface of the moon. And every time that happens, then uh, then you have uh, they have a new crater there. And we often look at how old the surface is by how many craters and uh, uh, from comets and asteroids there are on the surface. Now, Pluto should be a really old surface as well. It's formed at the same time as the moon. Everything in the solar system was formed four and a half billion years ago. But if you look at Pluto, there's not very many craters on it. So that's kind of telling you that it's a young surface, but it can't be young because Pluto is supposed to be a really old planet. So what do we think is going on here? We think that perhaps Pluto was repainted recently, resurfaced. And so this is kind of like, you know, you can, if you have a truck which is driving through the streets, uh, you can uh, guess how old that truck is by how much, how, how many scratches, how many dents, how beat up this truck is. Like on the left there, you can see that truck has been around for a couple of decades. But on the right, 
you see this truck and this truck looks brand new, but it's from a style, you know, it's old, but from how fresh it is, it looks brand new. So it's like an old truck, which has been repainted. And in this case, repainted within the last five lakh years. And so Pluto's surface looks so much younger. Uh, it looks like Pluto has an active interior. So there's so something has come out and recovered all of Pluto's surface. So this is the science team, just as we're seeing this first image come down, really exciting. So we spent the day looking at this image and I, these pictures are great. You know, this is the science team, these are geologists and they're just running their, uh, running their hands over, the, over the, uh, the surface of Pluto as they're trying to uh, understand the geology on the surface. Here's a science team as we're waiting. So this whole day we spend looking at Pluto and just this first image. And now at eight o'clock in the evening, finally this, uh, uh, we're going to get the signal from, from the spacecraft, whether it's successfully passed through the Pluto system and taken thousands more pictures or not. So we're waiting, we're waiting. Uh, here we are uh, watching uh, Alice Bowman at the center there again on the, on the, uh, in the Mission Operations Center as she's talking with the antennas to see if, uh, see if it has successfully come down. And we hear, yes, uh, we have heard from the spacecraft. And so this is really exciting. The spacecraft has successfully made it through the Pluto system and taken pictures. Now, it's still going to take us a year to get all these pictures down, but we're really excited that we've taken these images. This is uh, one of the geologists on the mission. Uh, here's some of the other scientists and friends of the family uh, on the spacecraft as well. So um, what's amazing here, it took us nine and a half years to get there. It took us six billion kilometers, and we arrived at Pluto one minute early. So navigating through the laws of physics is actually pretty simple. Flying a spacecraft through the solar system, we know the mass of Jupiter. We know the mass of the sun. We know the distance to Pluto. We can measure these things very well. There's nothing that gets in the way. This isn't like driving through the streets of Bombay where there's uh, traffic and there's, uh, and there's uh, uh, cows and there's everything in the way that might be, uh, uh, might be shutting things down. Um, and you have to make thousands and thousands of corrections along your way as you're driving and you don't know when you're gonna get there. Uh, but um, flying through space, it's just gravity and we can predict those things. So. Um, we can get to Pluto on almost exactly the same time as we, uh, as we predicted. Now, if you take that image, that global image Pluto, and you, you stretch it a little bit, let's just exaggerate the colors, you can really see the difference. Um, these different regions are caused by different colors, different types of ice. Uh, we have some regions which are pure nitrogen ice. Nitrogen ice, just N2. Uh, other regions, like on the lower left here, it's organic molecules. These are probably hazes, which are made in the atmosphere from uh, photolysis of, uh, um, with uh, ultraviolet light. And it's fallen back down to the atmosphere. And uh, then the different regions are different types of ice as well. And they're pretty well separated. They're not really all mixed in with each other. If you zoom in, here we are zooming into the heart of Pluto. And uh, you, can see the, uh, you can see these different cells. And it kind of looks like, you know, we think of ice as being a solid, but we know that ice actually isn't a solid. Like if you go up in the Himalaya, uh, that's why it's dangerous up there is because you have the ice falls and uh, in, the, in the high mountains where, where ice is a glacier and the glacier sort of flows and it creeps and it moves very, very slowly, you know, maybe a kilometer per year as gravity is slowly pushing this ice. Um, and so it's kind of a fluid, but kind of a solid. Well, the same thing is, happens on the surface of Pluto. Nitrogen ice is a very soft ice. And so it flows and it turns over, not, not in your hand, but over the course of years, it flows and turns over. And uh, it flows to, uh, to allow heat to escape from the interior. So it's convecting. And so this is just like if you're, if you're uh, you know, boiling a pot. Uh, here we have a pot of, uh, of pudding here. And the, the ice is, or the, the pudding is turning over and convecting as heat is trying to escape from the from the center. Well, the same thing happens on Pluto, that this is turning over and convecting as heat is escaping from the center. So it takes tens of years to turn over, but it's the same process that you might happen on your stovetop. And here we have, uh, also on the surface of Pluto, we have the highest mountains that we see in the solar system. These are 4,000 meters high, four kilometers, but this is on the smallest planet in the solar system. And yet, uh, so these are not the highest mountains in the solar system, but they're the half the height of Mount Everest. Uh, on the smallest planet. So uh, why do we have these? We have no idea. We have this giant hole down here, which might be volcanism from, uh, from uh, the lava on Pluto. It's actually water, liquid water 
is the same as lava because that's the, that's the liquid form of the, um, of the essentially the rocks, the ice that make Pluto. So we think this might be an ice volcano, this little hole on the surface of Pluto. As you look through other regions of the surface of Pluto, you see some places where there's craters which have been filled in by ice flowing. You see some other places, places where mountains are sticking up through the nitrogen ice. And, uh, and then other regions where there's a very sharp line between the dark regions and the white regions. So there's so much geology happening on the surface of Pluto. It doesn't look at all like the moon uh, where the moon is pretty uniform in its geology. There's craters all over the surface. Um, but not Pluto. Now here's Pluto's moon, Charon. Pluto's moon, Charon, you can tell immediately is looks very different than Pluto. It has a lot more craters on it, especially in the south southern half there. And then there's this big crack going across the center. In this crack, uh, well, we think this is probably from from uh, thermal con thermal uh, cooling. Like if you're baking some bread, um, as the bread expands or contracts then uh, you often get cracks going down it. Same thing is probably happening with Pluto or with Charon is there's this big crack going down the center of it from it contracting as it cooled. We also flew past the small satellites. Now we don't, we didn't have the best images of some of them because they're very, very small. Uh, but Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra were important parts of the solar, of, uh, of the Pluto system as well. We're making new maps of Pluto and Charon using names from around the world. Uh, here we have the Norgay Montes, uh, named after uh, uh, Tenzing Norgay of Nepal. Those are the tallest mountains that we see on the surface of Pluto. And there's other, uh, other names, named from uh, cultures across the world. And this is one of our last images of Pluto as we were leaving the planet. Uh, you can see that all the terrain here, uh, from the flat uh, nitrogen ice plains on the right, to the really, really tall mountains, to the layers of the atmosphere. Now, uh, when we lived uh, in Bombay, I like to look at the layers of the atmosphere on the earth as the sun was setting in the evening. And you could see that just as the sun went down, just the final minutes as the sun was going down, you could see the sun refracted through the atmospheric layers. But Pluto has a, has a uh, atmospheric structure, which is one lakh times thinner than the, uh, than the Earth's atmosphere. So, so much thinner atmosphere, but yet there's so much detail in the, uh, in the atmospheric structure. At, at Pluto. One final image here is as we're going across, so we scanned our camera across in a panorama across the, uh, across the heart-shaped region of Pluto. And you can just see all of the varied terrain here. You can see the edge of Pluto there um, with the terrain from the craters and the mountains. And then as we pan down here, you can see the impact craters, some impact craters with black material below them. You can see these regions that look like scratches, like from a cat going across the surface of Pluto. The terrain gets a little bit rougher. Uh, suddenly it turns into this network of valleys and uh, valleys and glaciers and mountains. And then it turn, turns into this, uh, into the, it kind of looks like an ocean here. Now this is an ocean of frozen nitrogen ice. Uh, and these, what look like waves in there are pits which are carved by the sun, um, uh, melting away and sublimating away some of the nitrogen ice. So I had my predictions for what you would see at Pluto. I predict that Pluto would be uh, kind of have a lot of impact craters on it and not much else, uh, be very dead. What I found out is that I was completely wrong. Pluto's not dead. Pluto was very much, uh, very much dynamic and active. There was a lot of geology which is happening on the surface of Pluto. It's very warm in the interior, not super warm, but warmer a couple of degrees warmer than we thought, and that causes all this geology to be happening because there's all this heat escaping from the core. So Pluto's surface, we thought would be about maybe 35 degrees um, above absolute zero. So what is that, about 250 degrees, uh, negative 250 Celsius. And it's a couple of degrees warmer than that, but just that couple of degrees difference makes a huge difference in how dynamic uh, the surface of Pluto is. So all my guesses were completely wrong. That's okay, I don't care whether I'm right or wrong. It's more interesting to be wrong because then you learn something. So we flew past Pluto in 2015. It took, takes about three years to transmit all the data uh, from, uh, from the Pluto encounter back to Earth because it's a very slow connection going 6 billion kilometers back to Earth. And, uh, and then uh, once this data was transmitted back to Earth, uh, we had a great spacecraft. The spacecraft is still flying, still in operation, and we didn't really know what to do next with it. So uh, we were looking, and we and we thought, well, let's um, let's just see if there's another object on our way. And so uh, 
we wanted to, we were flying toward the Kuiper belt and we thought, well, let's see if we can go past another Kuiper belt object. Now we used some telescopes on the ground, some of the giant uh, 10 meter class telescopes and we couldn't find anything. And we looked and we looked and we looked, we couldn't find anything. So we're left with one option, which is to use the Hubble Space Telescope to search for another Kuiper belt object that would be on our path that we could walk, that we could uh, fly past. As soon as we started using Hubble, we actually found something pretty quickly. Uh, here's our uh, here's our object. It's called um, Arakoth. Um, also, it was known as Ultima Thule, or known as MU69, uh, at different times when we were dis when we uh, when we discovered it. And you can see it circled in the in the white uh, uh, circle in the in the I'm sorry, blue circles there, as it's moving through space past some stars. Now, Arakoth we knew is really really small because everything in this Kuiper belt is much smaller than um, than at Pluto. Um, these Kuiper belt objects, we've never seen any of these close up. We don't know anything about them. We knew the position of this. We knew that our, it was close to our path. And uh, we, we knew that we could get very close to it on January 1st, 2019. But that's all we knew about it. Um, we know that it's, we knew from its, from its brightness that it was really small. It was so small, we couldn't tell its size or its shape or its, even its position. And this makes it, makes planning to fly past it very hard. In fact, it's, a whole lot harder to fly past Arakoff than it was to fly past Pluto. Because Pluto we've been observing for almost 100 years. It's very bright. Arakoff is 10,000 times fainter. It's 2 billion kilometers further out. We don't know anything about its size or its position or its orbit or its brightness. And so we're essentially flying in the dark. We need to target our cameras at it precisely with the right exposure in the center of our frame while flying in the dark at 50,000 kph. So it's extraordinarily hard to fly past this object and take properly exposed images of it. If we want to know its position, you know, for anything in the solar system, there's um, kind of two ways we can do this. One, we can measure it directly just by taking a picture with the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's easy, like, you know, like here's a Hubble Space Telescope picture. You can just zoom in on it, zoom in. Zoom in, but you can only zoom in so far. You, you know, as you zoom in more and more, uh, you, all you see is just the uh, just the pixels here. And so this is the Hubble Space Telescope image. Arakoth is about one uh, one hundredth of a pixel across uh, for its position, and so you can't even measure its position precisely, even with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. But there's another way you can you can uh, use to measure the position of something in the solar system. And you can just watch it as it passes in front of a distant star and blocks it to light. So this is essentially like a solar eclipse where the moon travels in front of the sun. And uh, so uh, for faint stars, um, for a star, this works very well. If you take, uh, if you have a, your Kuiper belt object that moves in front of a distant star, uh, each of those is very, very, very tiny. And so if you're lucky enough to catch the Kuiper belt object moving in front of a star, you know that each of those is so small that if they are lined up exactly and one blocks out the light of the, of this, of the other, then you know they're lined up exactly. And then you know its position exactly. Now you have to be at the right place, the right time, just like a solar eclipse to watch that. And this is really hard to do, but if you can't measure its position with Hubble, then you can measure it using a stellar occultation. It's the right time. Hubble is not at the right place at the right time. So you have to take your telescope to the right place at the right time. So we bought a lot of telescopes. Uh, here's our stack of telescopes right there. We flew these telescopes uh, to places around the world where we knew there would be a stellar occultation, where we predicted that our target would be moving in front of this object, uh, moving in front of a distant star. So here we are, we're in South Africa. We rented a lot of pickup trucks and drove across South Africa to set up our telescopes. Here we are outside of Cape Town. We have, uh, these are 14-inch uh, telescopes. They're uh, made by Skywatcher. They're a go-to Dobsonian telescope. So it's a, it's a nice telescope, but um, this is in terms of the size of telescopes that professional astronomers use usually. Um, this is a large amateur telescope, but, but, but a very small professional telescope, but it was the perfect telescope for us. Uh, big enough to uh, to see our target, which is about a uh, about a 17th magnitude star, but small enough that we could still carry them around in a truck. So we bought 25 of these telescopes. We sent them to Africa. Here's the path of our uh, of the. Uh, essentially, this is just you can think of this as being like the shadow path of the solar eclipse, but this is not a solar eclipse. This is a stellar occultation. So same thing, just a much much smaller star that's being blocked out. 
but it's, and it gets blocked out for about three seconds as this shadow moves across South Africa and then across the ocean and then also in Argentina. So we actually had a team of astronomers set up in South Africa. We had another team set up in Argentina and we were on this path to monitor it to see exactly where and when uh, this faint star disappeared. And that would tell us exactly where our target was so we could fly past it with New Horizons. So this is August 3rd, 2017. We had months of planning for our three second observation. Uh, here we are, uh, the group I was with set up in South Africa, just outside an ostrich farm. And that's the Southern sky there. And you know what? We had 15 telescopes set up there and we missed it. Uh, we missed it because we we're in the wrong, wrong place. Uh, we, were, we were close, but we were, about, we were off by about 100 kilometers. Um, but by the end, we knew we were off by 100 kilometers. So we, that gave us actually data to try again. So we did it again. Um, we did it from a uh, Boeing 747 in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which has a 2.4 meter telescope in it. We saw, perhaps we saw the edge of the shadow there. That led us, that helped us refine our position again. And we saw it again, we looked again from Argentina and we saw it uh, later from 22 different telescopes. Um, then we did it again in Colombia, 2018. That's where this photo was. Uh, I went to Colombia as well. Uh, we got rained out. So nine telescopes, we missed it in all of them. Uh, but then we saw it, we had another success in Senegal uh, where we saw it in five more telescopes. By the time, by the time we saw this uh, occultation a bunch of times, we could actually piece together the size and position and even the shape of our, uh, of our object. So here on this, on this uh, chart on the left there, you can actually see the shadow of our, uh, of our shape. And you see that thing, it kind of looks like a snowman, kind of looks like two blobs. Well, that's what we predicted that our target, our Kuiper Belt object would look like. So I want, to, want you to keep in mind that shape. This is, this is not a picture, but this is the plot of each of our, uh, each of our occultations all put together. So this is um, you know, many, many trips to many continents, uh, all put together in one plot uh, to, uh, uh, to predict what the shape and position and size of our target is. So this is what we guessed it would look like. So um, now we're back on a spacecraft. We're, we're coming toward Arakoth. Uh, we're supposed to get to our, to our target on January 1st, 2019. About four months ahead of that, we can finally see it for the first time from, from the spacecraft. And then every day we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. Uh, but uh, it's not getting bigger and that's because it's, we're, still, uh, we're still a long way away from it. So um, this is our uh, operations center at the Applied Physics Lab. And uh, come December, 2018, the team reassembles to uh, prepare for the observations. Every day, uh, we get closer and closer. But uh, our cost is so small that even the day before we fly past it, it's still just one pixel across. It's not, uh, this isn't like Pluto, where every day it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Our cost is so small, so tiny, just about 10 or 20 kilometers across, that it wasn't yet getting any bigger. So we were planning to fly past it at uh, uh, just uh, 12.33 in the morning on January 1st, just past the new year. So everybody else was having a New Year's party at midnight. Well, we postponed our New Year's party until 12.33 a.m. because that's the time that we were flying past our cost. And, uh, and so we were celebrating there. So uh, uh, at the center there is uh, Dr. Alan Stern, the principal investigator of the mission. Uh, that's actually my daughter uh, who lived with us in Bombay for three years in the, uh, in the uh, orange spacesuit there on the right. And uh, we we're really excited as the spacecraft was making its closest approach to our cost. We knew the spacecraft was doing its close approach. Again, it, we had commanded it to take pictures of the, uh, of the object, but not send them back yet. It takes, uh, uh, takes about two years to send all the images back. Um, but we did get the uh, uh, confirmation from the spacecraft that it successfully encountered um, and taken, taken its uh, observation sequence. So here's the principal investigator with the mission operations manager again in the control room. We got our first image back about uh, uh, later this later uh, that day on January 1st. And this is just a surreal time to see the first images coming back from 6 billion kilometers away in the outer solar system. And there you have it right there. Uh, so there were, this is late at night, not everybody was around, uh, but I was uh, among those lucky to see this. And so here we see um, the outer solar system Kuiper belt for the first time. And it looks like a snowman. It looks like there's two objects there, two blobs. How well did we actually predict its shape? 
Remember, we predicted its shape and its position and size using a bunch of telescopes from the back of pickup trucks. Uh, this is uh, one of our, uh, uh, Mark Bowie, the, uh, one of the chief scientists on the mission. That's a 3D printed model that he'd made predicting what the shape was. Behind him is the image of the actual shape. How well did he do? Looks like we did perfectly. So uh, um, it's amazing what sort of science you can do with cheap telescopes and backup pickup trucks. Here he is taking the uh, victory lap. Uh, so exciting that we actually nailed the observations here. Really emotional time for everybody involved in the mission. This was such a difficult observation. And as our images came back, uh, we got a sharper and sharper uh, picture of what this outer solar system body actually looked like. Now, I'm just showing you this couple of sequences here because it took a couple of months for our best images to come back down. But on the right there is what uh, we think that this uh, object looks the most like. So this is a picture in natural light, like what we, you would see if you were looking at it yourself. <clears throat> it's the oldest thing that we've ever seen in the, uh, in the solar system. Um, it's been untouched. It was made four and a half billion years ago and it's been untouched since then. This is what we call a planetesimal. This is one of the raw ingredients that the planets are built with. It looks like a snowman. It's about 30 kilometers from tip to tip. And uh, this is from a region of the solar system, which we've never visited and has never visited us either. We call this the cold classical belt of the Kuiper belt. And so all the comets and asteroids uh, they come from different regions in the solar system. This is not a comet. It's not an asteroid. People debate whether Pluto is a planet or not. This is not a planet. This is much smaller than, uh, than a planet. And you can see a couple of things from this. Well, it's made of two different bodies. You can tell they, they crashed into each other, but probably slowly. This wasn't a violent impact um, because there's not, a, there's not a huge crater where it was cracked apart or anything like that. You can see some small impact craters on this. No, no big impact craters, but on the side there, on the right-hand side, you can see some smaller impact craters, maybe one big one in the upper right-hand corner. You can see it's kind of reddish. That tells you a little bit about the composition. Um, so uh, these were probably formed in the same region of the Kuiper Belt. The bottom half looks kind of lumpy, like it's the merger of a couple of smaller bodies, sort of like the bread roll made of the merger of smaller bodies as well. So what happened is that bodies like Arakoth were formed four and a half billion years ago. And then gravity caused them to come together. And you had millions of these, which then formed Pluto and formed the Earth and formed Jupiter and, and all the other planets from, uh, from planet the cores of the other, of the giant planets as well, from planetesimals like this. But this is the first time that we've seen one of these uh, planetesimals from the outer solar, solar system up close at all. We didn't answer very many questions. We have a lot of questions which are still out there. Why is this two bodies? Um, this is just one Kuiper Belt object, one planetesimal. How similar does it look to other systems which are out there? We don't know what's going on with the geology. Um, it's, uh, it's the shape is a little bit like what we predicted, but it's, uh, it's actually a little bit flatter than what we predicted. So there's so many, uh, so many other unknown questions that we're still working on here. We don't even have all of our data yet down, uh, still downlinking the spacecraft every day. And uh, we see it looks a little bit like some of the shapes from uh, uh, older comets that we have, but you can see how much younger this looks like. If you look at this comet uh, called CG on the right there, that comet has gone past the sun many, many times and that's caused it to sublimate away. But you can see how old and pristine and untouched Ultima or uh, Arakoth is here on the left. So this looks, looks uh, a little bit similar, but in a very, very different state of preservation. So our spacecraft is still continuing. Um, we will fly past another target if we find one. We haven't found one uh, yet. We're actually searching for one right now as we speak using the uh, giant Subaru telescope in Hawaii. Um, we are getting toward the outer edge of the Kuiper Belt, so we don't know if we'll find one or not, but we certainly hope so. Eventually in about 2030, we're gonna, we're gonna leave the Kuiper Belt. Uh, there's no way to slow down our spacecraft or turn it around, so it's gonna keep on going. In another 50,000 years, it will leave the solar system eventually another five lakh years or so, it will um, uh, leave the sun and uh, fly past the next star. And we're not gonna be operating the spacecraft until then because of course the batteries and the fuel are gonna be, be depleted in the next couple of decades. Um, but uh, we are happy to be uh, continuing to operate the spacecraft and exploring the uh, outer reaches of the solar system. So thank you so much, here's our team. Um, and uh, there's, our, there's our website if you want to check it out to uh, follow the latest uh, uh, discoveries that we make as we continue to explore the outer solar system. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Uh, thanks a lot, Henry, for the great talk. You have built up the excitement of New Horizons mission over the decade in uh, a talk of about an hour. Uh, we have lots of questions. Uh, there were two platforms on which the program was running. One was on Zoom platform. And since we had an overwhelming ref, uh, response, uh, some of the participants watched it on YouTube live streaming. So there will be questions coming from both the platforms. I'll take the questions from Zoom group and Abhay will take the questions from uh, uh, YouTube group. So I'm starting with the questions. And the first question is from our member Shailesh Sansare, uh, who has said that now, which is the mission that you are working on? So I am uh, still a member of the science team of the New Horizons mission, um, and I've now uh, uh, I'm now working at NASA headquarters, where I'm uh, involved in um, uh, planning the observations and and uh, for um, and and management for a number of other missions in the solar system. I'm involved with, uh, for instance, the Juno mission, which is at Jupiter. Uh, I'm involved with the uh, we have a mission called Osiris Rex, uh, which is uh, going to be taking a sample of the uh, asteroid named Bennu. It's going to be taking this sample uh, later on this year. And there's many, many other missions which I have uh, some involvement with in the, uh, 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 at NASA headquarters. We have um, uh, maybe 10 or 12 uh, operating missions in the solar system right now and uh, plans for many more coming up. Okay. Uh, and he has a second question. He is asking you whether there is any visual data of minor planets observatory providing for analysis. Uh, I'm sorry, the question is, is there any uh, virtual data? Visual, visual data. Visual data, yes. Um, so there's a lot of, so um, uh, all of our data from the New Horizons mission is available to anybody, anybody on earth, uh, anybody in India, anybody in any country can download all of the observations from New Horizons. Um, uh, you can go to our website and find the observations right there. All of NASA's data is available for free to anybody in the world. Um, and so th that includes all the data from New Horizons and it also includes all the data from say the Cassini mission and from the Mars Curiosity rover and so forth. Uh, as far as the minor planets, which, some, which uh, refers to the asteroids, um, there are many observations of the asteroids. A lot of the observations of asteroids are made by ground-based telescopes. Uh, some of those are available for free and some of them are not available for free because they're just taken by an individual with a telescope. But if you go to the MPC, which is the Minor Planet Center, then a lot of the data from those observations are available. Okay. Great. Uh, the next question is from uh, Ramakrishna, and he is asking uh, how risky was the journey, and how many obstacles or challenges did the New Horizon project face through the course of journey? Because you had mentioned that even a small dust particle can be lethal to the mission. So, how many did you encounter? Our spacecraft worked almost perfectly. We had essentially zero technical problems with the mission itself. The, by far the, 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 the most scary part of the mission was when we, uh, when we lost the spacecraft just 10 days before the encounter with Pluto, which I discussed. Um, that was not because of a technical problem on the spacecraft. That was because of a mistake that we made on the ground where we were over taxing the spacecraft and we hadn't tested it properly. So that was entirely our fault, uh, not an unpredicted uh, hardware issue with the, with the spacecraft. Um, and if you look at the history of spacecraft failures, almost all of them are caused, uh, <laughs> you know, by by people, not by uh, not by unpredictable hardware failures. So um, our spacecraft was designed intentionally to be very simple. It doesn't have very many moving parts. In fact, uh, it doesn't have any motors or gears or mechanisms or anything like that. It was designed intentionally to be very simple, uh, so that it would be reliable after nine years, and uh, and it's done that job fantastically. Okay. Now, uh, Abhay will ask a few questions. Yeah, uh, this is Abhay here, and uh, Ms. Amruta Ayer from YouTube uh, Live, she's asking a question. Why did the New Horizon mission not have landing on Pluto? In that way, we could have much more collected information. That's it would be great to land on Pluto. I would love to land on Pluto. Um, but here's the thing, uh, we are moving so fast. And we, we, our, our speed was about 30,000 kilometers per hour. And uh, 
we would have to slow down to zero kilometers per hour if we wanted to land on Pluto. And to slow down uh, on the Earth, you just put on the brakes. But to put on the brakes in space, what you have to do is turn your engines on and actually turn your engines on and burn them backwards uh, to slow yourself down because there's nothing to push on. Uh, so you need to use fuel to slow yourself down. And it would actually take so much fuel, it would take hundreds and hundreds of kilograms of fuel to slow us down. And uh, we didn't have the capacity to take all that extra fuel along with us. In fact, if we would have taken enough fuel to slow us down, uh, then we wouldn't have even got out to Pluto because our spacecraft would have been so heavy. So it's extraordinarily difficult to slow down at Pluto so that we could land or orbit. Now, NASA does have some missions uh, under study right now. Uh, there's one mission, which is a Pluto orbiter, which they are studying that would slow down. It would take a long extra fuel to slow it down. But it, uh, it takes a long time to get out there. In fact, it takes uh, almost 30 years to get out to Pluto if you take enough fuel to slow yourself down so that you can go in orbit. Great. She has got one more question, but there is one more lady, Shubhangi. She also has got a similar question. Uh, Amrita is asking uh, if the spacecraft had collided with an asteroid, how do we control it? And Shubhangi is asking in the same line, was there no worry of the spacecraft colliding with any other planet on its way? And the answer is no, there is no worry of it colliding with another planet. Um, and that's because, you know, if you go outside right now, you can see the stars and you can see the moon and you can see Jupiter and Saturn. And there's not any other planets which are in the way. Space is mostly empty. And uh, if there were planets uh, in the way, then you would see them. You wouldn't be able to see all the way out to the stars because the stars are, are billions of, uh, you know, trillions of miles away. And there's nothing there between you and them. And so space is almost all empty. Um, the only thing which is in space is, uh, you know, about in every, every cubic meter might have a couple molecules of gas and, uh, you know, a tiny, tiny dust particle. Uh, most of the dust particles are way too small to, uh, to affect us. You know, a micron sized dust particle is too small. It doesn't affect us. The only thing that the biggest risk to us could be like a, a large dust particle, which is a millimeter across. Fortunately, those are very rare. We were worried about them, but we did our calculations um, and we concluded there were none. And that was that ended up being being correct. So even flying through the asteroid belt, we think of the asteroid belt as being very dense and you have to steer around asteroids. But it turns out that's not the case. Um, you uh, and uh, you, know, you or I or anybody could just walk through the asteroid belt and you could go at full speed through the asteroid belt. You could go back and forth with your eyes closed through the asteroid belt uh, more than one million times without having any risk of running into an asteroid. It's that empty. Great. Uh, there, are, uh, there is one question which almost many people are asking and I would name Harshal, Sunil and Yagyaseni. They want to know what is the time delay for sending the commands and receiving the data or time for data transmission for the New Horizon telescope. So it takes about four and a half hours uh, for a signal to go from us to the spacecraft or from the spacecraft back to the Earth, about four and a half hours. Okay, Yagisini has got one more question and I think it's common interest to you as well as uh, Sujata. And the question is, does, uh, were any microbiology studies being done or any samples for taking the study were taken or not? Oh yeah, um, it would be great. Uh, but uh, no, the answer is no, we did not. And that's, and that's because all of the, all of the um, studies of biology that we know on the Earth are, um, all the life that we know on the earth is uh, at temperatures near that of liquid water because every form of life that we've ever seen requires liquid water. And uh, at Pluto, it's very, very cold. It's 250 degrees below the temperature of liquid water freezing. And so without liquid water and without any other liquids there, we think that's just too cold to support any life. Uh, it would be great to search for life anyway, because we might be surprised by what we see. Uh, but all at, at, at lower temperatures, chemistry moves much slower. And we just don't think that there's enough energy and enough chemistry for there to be uh, the large molecules that, uh, that are required for complex life or, or any form of life that we know about. So there are many good places to look for life throughout the solar system. We should look at Europa. We should look at Enceladus. We should look at Titan. Uh, we've looked at Mars a lot. These are the really good places to look for life, but Pluto is not a very good place to look for life. Okay, I'm back here, Henry, uh, to ask you a further set of questions. Uh, 
the next question is asked by Vandan and Vandan is asking on earth we have GPS system so that we know our exact location. How we scientists, how the scientists know location in space? Oh yeah, yeah, great question. So we listen to it by, it's essentially the same way as GPS. Uh, GPS uses triangulation. And so you know essentially how long it takes a signal to get from one position to in the, from one place to another. Uh, triangulation and, and timing the signal are, are essentially the same thing. Um, so we can actually listen to the spacecraft from, from two radio dishes at the same time. And we know from exactly what part of the sky the, uh, the signal is coming. And we can also know the Doppler shift of the, of the signal because the, the, the spacecraft has uh, what we call a USO, an ultra stable oscillator on board. And so that puts out a signal at a very known frequency. And uh, when we receive that signal on Earth, it has a different frequency. And that's because of its Doppler shift. And its Doppler shift relates to the velocity of the spacecraft. And then in, when we look at the spacecraft in the sky, we know its position in the sky. And we've been monitoring the spacecraft for, uh, you know, since launch uh, in uh, 1996. Uh, I mean, in 2006, it's been 14 years now. We've been monitoring it for all this time. And so any change in its position or any change in its velocity, uh, we know. And so we can put all these together to, uh, to do the navigation, to, um, to, to find a way uh, through the solar system and know where our spacecraft is. Wow, that's quite a detailed and interesting answer. The next <laughs> question is from uh, Pranit. He is asking that, uh, since Pluto turned out to be geologically active and the uh, New Horizon mission was going to pass uh, along the five planets to reach Pluto, were there any uh, sensors for measuring geophysical parameters like gravity and magnetism and so on? Or did it have only the optical camera? Yeah, great question. So magnetism... Uh, no, there wasn't a mag there was no magnetometer. In retrospect, maybe we should have taken a magnetometer because it probably would have been really interesting. Um, uh, because Pluto has a core which is perhaps convecting, perhaps with uh, salt water in its in its core convecting. Perhaps there would be a magnetic field, and we might have learned something if we would have had a magnetometer on board. Um, we are able to learn a little bit, little bit about Pluto's uh, mass distribution from um, uh, not from a seismometer because we didn't land on the surface, but from, from the Doppler shift as we fly past the planet. That tells us something about its mass and its mass distribution. Um, it's not nearly as sensitive as having a seismometer, which is actually on the ground there. Um, and so we had no other geophysical instruments. Um, well, I, it's, I guess we, we did, we were able, some of our sensors were able to uh, detect um, some of the atmosphere as it was escaping from Pluto into space. And that atmosphere comes from the surface. And so in some sense, that's another, uh, another geophysical instrument, which, uh, which tells us about what, was, uh, what used to be on the surface as well. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Shruti. Uh, and she is asking, how did they decide to have a look at Arukoth from Argentina, Senegal, and various places? Yeah, so the reason why we went to these various places to... Uh, for the stellar occultation is that we we have very good catalogs of the sky and we knew that we knew the rough position of our of our target as it was moving through the sky of Arakoth. And so we predicted that there would be a stellar occultation that Arakoth would move in front of a star and it would be uh, when it would be visible from Argentina and from Senegal and from South Africa and so forth on these dates. Now we didn't know exactly uh, you know, what latitude and longitude in Argentina it would be visible from. Um, and we didn't know exactly what second it would be, uh, the star would disappear. But we knew, you know, plus minus 100 kilometers where, where we would have to go to. And we knew plus minus, you know, 10 seconds or 20 seconds when the shadow path would be expected to get there. So that's why we had many observers. That's why we went there with, that's why we bought 20 telescopes, not just one. Uh, so we could set these 20 telescopes out uh, each person on a slightly different path, maybe separated by a kilometer or two kilometers from each other. And uh, that, let us, uh, that let us study um, uh, you know, many different paths and see where the shadow actually was. Okay. So it's really an across the globe activity. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the next question is from one of the senior members of Kagol Mandal. And right now he is in the same continent as yours. And uh, he, Ashirwad, is asking, uh, our solar system is said to be formed from previous generation massive star. Are there any evidences found by New Horizons? For example, Kuiper Belt could be a portion of the remains of our father star's explosion. Yeah, um, so this is quite true that uh, we're all born of born of stars in the past. But that mostly is the uh, is the composition, the elements, the elemental composition of the solar system is is caused by previous generations of stars. Um, the actual the supernova, which uh, uh, which forms these previous elements in, is very violent, and it's actually violent enough that it would destroy any Kuiper belt or any planets or any uh, you know essentially any molecules uh, uh, which are which are left around from the previous uh, from the previous solar system which is there. So. Um, all of the things that we, all of the physical objects and dust and planetesimals that we see in our solar system now, those are ones which, uh, which are formed at the same time as our solar system formed. The, the, uh, the atoms were formed in a previous generation of stars, but all of the dust and assemblages and planetesimals were formed only in our solar system. Yeah, Henry, there are questions from the YouTube channel now for you. And Pritish is asking, how do you decide which areas on Pluto are to be photographed? <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, that we spent we spent uh, nine years trying to study that, and um, uh, we we did a lot of modeling. We did a lot of uh, it, essentially, it's a guess. In the end, it's a guess. We we, we just we wanted to uh, study as much of the surface as we could. And, uh, but we didn't know what the most, in, you know, there's only one spot where we have the highest resolution, you know, what's the best place for our highest resolution images. And we kind of had to guess at that, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's a balance between, um, you know, how much data, for instance, of the, uh, of the whole surface of Pluto do you want to get versus how much high res data of, you know, one portion do you want to get. And then keep in mind when we're flying past, Pluto is on the one side of us, and Charon is in the, on the other side. And so you wanna get data from both Pluto and Charon. Uh, and then portions of Pluto are in a shadow, so you can't see it at all. And portions of Pluto are also uh, around the backside. And so they're lit, but, but they're visible only every 6.5 days as, as, uh, as Pluto rotates. So, so we were not able to see portions of it at all because it was dark. And we're not able to see some portions at high resolution, only at low resolution. And so we balanced all of these things together in trying to come up with our observation plan. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, many, many people are asking the question. And to name Meenal, Ria, and uh, Rucha, and Shubangi, they want to know uh, if it has got organic molecules, then why doesn't it have life on it? Ah, yes, great question. So organic molecules means uh, essentially anything which has uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen means organic molecules. But there's a lot of things which have organic molecules but have nothing to do with life. Like uh, carbon dioxide, for instance, just dry ice that you would buy is an organic molecule technically because it has carbon dioxide and it has, uh, uh, but, um, but, or water also. Um, but uh, does not have to do with actually being formed by life. So the word organic molecules is a little bit deceptive there. Um, we don't think that there is enough uh, energy because Pluto is just too cold for there to be anything uh, really related to life on Pluto. So it's much better to search in one of these other places like, uh, like I mentioned, like Europa, uh, because there you have, you have the same elements. You have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and you have also a lot of energy which can make the uh, uh, which make these complex molecules, which might go into forming life. Great. Uh, there's a question from Rishikesh Joglekar and similar by Dilip, and they are asking why is the ice in heart shape? Why not in circular bubble like <laughs> or parallel? Like the of Saturn, maybe. Yeah, we don't know. We have no idea. 
Uh, some people think that the, uh, the heart shape might be an impact crater. It might be the largest impact crater on the surface of Pluto. And it's just one uh, giant crater, which was then filled in with nitrogen ice. But we have no idea. Um, nobody really has an idea. Uh, if anybody wants to study it, please go to our website and download the data. And uh, you can study it and uh, you know, perhaps come up with a new, uh, new model for it. Good, good opportunity for those who are listening to this talk. Uh, Neha is asking why um, why was Arakot given so much of preference, and Tejas is wants to know why does the Arakot look like a snowman? Yeah, so Arakot looks like a snowman because it's two different spheres which came together. Um, we don't know uh, you know why it's two rather than three, but it looks like there was one planetesimal and then another planetesimal, and they slowly, slowly merged to each other. Uh, now, why was it given preference? It's because this is, the, this is the, we looked for many targets, and we actually found about five targets with the Hubble Space Telescope, but Arkoth was the one that we could get to most easily. Uh, we had to spend a little bit of fuel to, to uh, turn our spacecraft to fly past it on its trajectory. Um, but we didn't use all of our fuel. There were, there were some targets which were bigger, um, but uh, it would take more fuel to get past, past there. And what we wanted to do is save fuel so that if we found a second target in the Kuiper Belt, then we would have leftover fuel and maybe we could go past that one as well. So that's why we chose Arakoth over the other targets. Okay, now since we are on Arakoth, there are questions two people have asked. They're more or less similar. Uh, so Vinay and Shruti want to know uh, what are the few more exciting things to watch in Kuiper Belt which may come in future. And Shruti has asked, was there any other object other than uh, Arakoth that you want to see? Other things in the Kuiper Belt. So most studies of the Kuiper Belt um, happen from the ground. And so some of these giant telescopes, these 10 meter and 11 meter class telescopes are, are uh, what are uh, exploring most of the Kuiper Belt, and this is there is nothing else like like what well, like Arakoth. I mean, there are probably many many targets like Arakoth, but there's no other studies of it that will happen. Um, even if you come back in the the only spacecraft that we have that might fly past another Kuiper Belt object is New Horizons, and maybe it's sort of 50 50 odds as to whether we will find another target or not. And if we don't find another target you will never see another Kuiper Belt object for a long time because it's, it takes a long time to get to, this out, to the outer solar system. So it might be another, I don't know, 30 years uh, until NASA sends another mission out to the outer Kuiper Belt. Um, so uh, we have many other missions because there's many other missions, many other planets to explore through the solar system. Uh, you know, we're looking at missions that go to Venus and we're looking at missions that go to, uh, to Mercury and to Enceladus. And we have a mission that's uh, being built right now to go to Europa. And we have a mission which is going to Titan, the moon of Saturn. And uh, so, um, you know, the outer solar system kind of has had its mission. This is New Horizons. And now it's time for some of the other regions in the solar system to have their mission as well. So we are expecting a lot of interesting data to come in in near future. Okay, so the yes. next and, question- And I should add that uh, I'm very excited for, for uh, all the work that ISRO is doing uh, as well. Um, it's, it's fantastic. I know that Chandrayaan 2 was a, was a little bit of a, uh, such a disappointment um, that, yeah. the, uh, that the lander and that the, uh, and that the rover uh, did not land successfully this time, but I know that that's a, only a temporary setback. Uh, I know that everybody at NASA is so excited to see the work that, uh, that, that India is doing to explore the solar system. And uh, I know that India will continue to be such an important uh, uh, driver of, of work in the solar system. And we are all looking forward to Chandrayaan-3 or whatever, whatever the, uh, the, the next mission is from, uh, from ISRO. Oh, great. Same here. Yeah. Uh, we are still, I'm still on Arakot. Uh, one of the participants, Amog, found the method used to predict shape and location of Arakot mind-blowing. And he is asking if such occultation events are used to study other objects in Kuiper Belt or anywhere else, else in the space. And do astronomers travel to different countries regularly for such kind of observations? Yeah, so this was mind blowing to us too. Um, this worked astonishingly well. The answer is we have used occultations for a long time for, you know, 
a couple of decades. But this is by far the hardest occultation measurement which was ever done. Um, so it involved the most number of people and it was of the smallest object and it was the object which is furthest away and moving the slowest. So it's very common for people to do occultation measurements of the moon or of Saturn or even of Pluto itself. Um, but to do it of a Kuiper Belt object, which is just 10 kilometers across or 20 kilometers across is, ex is really, really new and had never been done before. Um, we hope that we will do it again. For instance, there's, a, there's another NASA mission called Lucy and Lucy is exploring uh, what we call the Trojan uh, asteroids. And those are, those are uh, asteroids which are essentially in, in Jupiter's orbit. And um, so we, uh, uh, we are actually using the same stellar occultation technique to try to study some of these Trojan asteroids to learn about them before the Lucy spacecraft actually gets out there. Uh, so uh, you can follow some of the results of those. It's uh, uh, not as hard. Uh, they're not as, not as far away as, the, um, as Arakoth, but they're actually smaller. And so uh, it's, it's challenging in its, uh, in its own way. Great. Uh, uh, even though Arakoth is so small, it is attracting many, many questions. So there are still two more questions yeah. on Arakoth. And uh, Atharva has asked, uh, is the technique you use to predict the shape of Arakoth is similar to use the, is similar to the technique used to detect exoplanets from Kepler Space Telescope? Yeah, it's 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 not exactly the same, but it's the same basic idea. So um, so with the Kepler space or with the uh, uh, exoplanets, you are looking for the planet which goes in front of a distant star, and uh, you can time exactly when that planet block starts blocking up the light from that distant star, and from that you you detect uh, you know you predict uh, you know the position and orbit of the planet, and so it's essentially uh, you know, I mean, there's there's one difference there, uh, in that the the um, with Kepler you can be anywhere on Earth because the planet, you know, the 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 light from the star gets blocked out, regardless of where on Earth you are. So every observer everywhere will see it the same way. Uh, with these occultations inside the solar system, uh, it's there's only one narrow path where you can see that occultation. So you have to be in the right place at the right time to see it. Um, and with uh, these Kepler things, you just have to be at the right time to see it, but you can be anywhere on, on Earth and it looks the same. Um, other than that, it's, uh, yeah, conceptually, basically the same thing. Okay. Uh, Shruti is asking, what was the resolution of the camera used to photograph Pluto and Arakot? Can you give some idea about it? Yeah, so the resolution, it's a one megapixel detector. So it's not very good compared with your iPhone detector. Uh, but keep in mind, the light is actually much lower out there. And so you don't want lots and lots of millions of pixels. You actually want uh, a small number of pixels, which are very sensitive. And so one megapixel is the, is the appropriate resolution for this camera. And it's a 10 inch, um, uh, you know, 10 inch aperture um, with this one megapixel detector. And that lets us get, I think the, the smallest uh, features that we saw on the surface of Pluto were about 30 meters across. Okay, uh, now Ramakrishna has very interesting question. He is asking, did you, what did you learn from New Horizons about Earth as opposed to learning about other planets uh, from it? <laughs> oh man. Um, you know, this, this, all this goes into telling us how the Earth formed, uh, because uh, we'd never seen planetesimals before. All the, all the, everything in the solar system forms from planetesimals. And so learning about how planetesimals form, learning what they look like, learning how many they are, learning what their composition is, tells us about how everything in the solar system formed, including Earth. Uh, there is not you know, there's not a lot of, that, that's, so that's the big picture. Um, there's not laws of physics that we learned here that will directly apply to Earth because it's the, the regime we're looking at is much different. Like, in fact, we're learning something, some things about the laws of physics as we study, um, uh, you know, how, how ice acts um, at very long, you know, at very cold temperatures under very high pressures. How does the core of Pluto uh, work? How does the core of Arakoth work? 
um, at these cold temperatures under high pressures. And this is actually something that we can't, even in the laboratories, we can't really simulate. We can't look at these uh, high, high pressures, low temperatures from Earth very well. So it tells us about physics that we can't even study on Earth. A few questions from um, from the YouTube group now, and Amruta and Meenal are asking, uh, how did the Charon, Charon got cracked surface? You said that Charon got a cracked surface as Pluto cools, so they want to know how does it happen? Yeah, so so um, as things cool, then they often uh, they contract, and uh, different things contract at different rates. And sometimes you see this, like uh, if you go to a glass factory, you might make a, you know, you make a glass and if you don't cool it at a, you know, glass has to be cooled at a very slow rate, because if you cool it at a fast rate, then different parts will cool, uh, will shrink or, or contract or expand a different amount as you apply temperature. And uh, that looks like probably what happened with with Sharon is that different parts were contracting at different rates as it cooled, and that caused this this crack, this this uh, you know sort of relative expansion of one region to another region. Okay, uh, Tejas, and there are a few more questions regarding what exactly is being happening now. The question is: Is uh, by Ketan uh, has New Horizon taken any picture of Earth from Pluto? That's one question. And is there a possibility of uh, finding origin of a comet from Cooper Belt from the New Horizon mission? And uh, if, if the Ultima Thule is the next target, so what after that? So three questions, one after one, two by Ketan, one by Tejas. Okay, uh, let's see. First question, have we ever taken a picture of Earth? Not recently. Uh, we probably took some pictures of Earth close up, um, but it's actually from where we are now, uh, we don't really want to take a, take a picture of Earth. One, it's it's uh, very it's very you know we're looking at the dark side of the Earth, and so the Earth is very distant and very faint and also very dark, and it's right next to the Sun, and so we don't want to risk the spacecraft by pointing it too close to the Sun either. Um, at this distance, it's probably not going to do any damage, but we don't want to risk it. Um, uh, let's see. The next question was. I'm sorry. Re, re, uh, the next question was: uh, Is there a possibility to find origin of comet from Cooper Belt? Yes. So um, uh, some comets come from different regions of the Kuiper Belt. Most comets, however, come from the Oort cloud, which is further out. And so, uh, it, the region that we went past uh, in. Uh, what Arakoth is, is not actually like a comet. Uh, it's a different region dynamically of the solar system. And it has nothing to do with where the comets came from. They came from, they come from a region which is now much further out. Okay. And the next question by Tejas is, what is New Horizons next target after Ultima? Oh, yeah. Good. Right now we don't. So uh, we are continuing to do some science on Kuiper belts, Kuiper belt objects. Uh, which we go past, but at a long distance, like at you know, 10 million kilometers away or 50 million kilometers away. We can detect some of these and we can see them and we can measure their brightness. We can measure their, uh, measure their rotation rate, things like that. Um, but we don't have one which is planned yet to fly past uh, close up, but hopefully we will. And 50-50 you know, on, on whether we actually find one or not. Uh, there's a question from Rajeshri, and she is asking if there's ice, then can water be found on Pluto? Yes, water's there. Um, water is actually very hard to detect spectroscopically. It doesn't have a, uh, in the infrared, the, the water band that we look for is very weak. And so it's very hard to prove that water is there, but almost certainly uh, water is very common on the surface of Pluto and Arakoth. Um, and that's because hydrogen and oxygen are very, very common throughout the universe. Uh, hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, and uh, by far. And oxygen is uh, uh, almost the uh, you know after hydrogen and helium. Um, I think oxygen is the most prevalent after that. So it's very common to expect that the water is almost everywhere throughout the uh, throughout the universe. What's rare is having liquid water. That's what makes the Earth unique is there's liquid water here, but water itself we see almost everywhere. And almost all the time it's, uh, it's either uh, in gaseous form or in um, frozen form. Okay, uh, Tejas once again has got a question about how do we maneuver in the space? The question is, what are the precautions and techniques used to avoid collision in space debris with space debris? 
while monitoring the spacecraft outside the space. Yeah, so the uh, with space debris, the, the, when you hear about that, that's mostly in things with things which are in orbit around the Earth. And that's because around the Earth, there's a lot of uh, spacecraft, there's a lot of uh, broken spacecraft, there's a lot of uh, particles and so forth uh, from spacecraft which have broken apart and busted apart. And so space debris is a very big hazard if you're in, in orbit around the Earth. And there's, I forget the number, but let's say 5,000 or 10,000 satellites in orbit around the Earth right now. And so for there, space hazard avoidance is very, very important. But once you leave the Earth, it's much, much easier. Um, for us flying through the asteroid belt, flying through the outer solar system, there's almost nothing on our way. The only place that we had a risk was at Pluto itself, where we thought there might be a dust risk. Um, and at, and at Arakoth, we, we thought there might be a dust risk as well. We did have a team, uh, which I was a member of, to, to look for dust along the, along the traje trajectory. So we did very, very intense deep searches to look for rings to look for dust, to look for clouds of dust, to look for anything which might uh, be in our path. And uh, we found nothing at all. Uh, Akshat has got a you know, very simple question and he wants to pursue a career in space sciences like, like perhaps you're doing. And so he wants to know, whether he's from India, so can he still have such a career uh, at NASA or some other location? So just a quick... <laughs> Yeah, there are. I work with many colleagues from India, um, and uh, so there's a there's a lot of great uh, uh, astronomers in the U.S. who are from India originally, or who uh, did their undergraduate in India. Um, so what I what I recommend for people is if you're interested in coming to the U.S., uh, you should study study uh, study physics uh, at, at a college in the in India, and uh, then consider coming abroad, whether it's to the U.S. or whether it's to Europe or whether it's to somewhere else. For, uh, for MSc or PhD studies. Um, a lot of students in, in the US, uh, once you're admitted to a program to study a PhD, um, then uh, you receive a bursary. So uh, NASA or the university will pay for your, pay for your education. Um, and that, that happens to a lot of schools in the US and also a lot of schools in, in Europe. Um, I have a lot of, uh, I was teaching at uh, St. Xavier's College and I have a number of my students who are from St. Xavier's College who are now studying uh, in in Europe or in the U.S. and uh, so I encourage you, you know, do well. Um, uh, talk with uh, talk with astronomers from and scientists from from other countries. Get to know them. Get to know what research they are. Um, do well, and then look at going going uh, to do uh, MSc or PhD studies abroad. Uh, from the Zoom group, also I have I had similar questions by two people, Atharva and Shruti, and I hope you have got your answers. Uh, Shruti has asked one more question related to this, and she has asked, "Is there any planning for NASA and ISRO to work together?" Yeah, so there's a uh, there's one mission which NASA and ISRO are working on now, and it's. Uh, I believe it's called NISAR. It's a um, it's a terrestrial mission, which is uh, uh, called uh, which is using synthetic aperture radar to measure the uh, I believe it's to measure the height of the ocean and the characteristics of the uh, ocean uh, on on Earth. Um, in the past, there have been a lot of collaborations between ISRO and uh, and NASA. Uh, for instance, on the um, on the Chandrayaan one mission, there were a number of NASA instruments which were on Chandrayaan one. And actually, even on Chandrayaan 2, uh, there was uh, NASA contributed uh, uh, what we call these uh, lunar or uh, retro reflectors. So these are essentially mirrors, uh, which are which are bolted to the lander on Chandrayaan 2, and uh, would have landed on the surface and been used to um, to to tell us exactly where on the surface the um, the lander had had landed. Um, and these are similar to the reflectors which the Apollo astronauts had took. Uh, uh, and placed on the surface of the moon uh, back in the 1960s. So I think it's I think that collaboration on international missions is fantastic. I think that NASA and Israel should continue to work together uh, because it's uh, it's uh, really great to have so many different countries uh, working together to explore the solar system and uh, and because uh, this is a um, you know it's great to have everybody working working together to do this. So please please continue. Oh. That's great. Uh, Ram Krishna has asked a lot of questions. He has asked earlier also, and now also there are many questions from him. Uh, he is now asking, 
uh, how and why did NASA see the need for such project as New Horizons? And the question continues, is there a secret greeting card inside the New Horizons for aliens who might come across the spacecraft? <laughs> yes. So I have uh, I have a couple of minutes. So maybe this is the last question that I will have time for. Um, but uh, let me answer. Let me answer both those. How did we choose to go to New Horizon? To choose to go to Pluto? There was a competition, and there was a competition between about thirty different missions, all of which were uh, wanted to go to uh, to Pluto. NASA identified Pluto as being an interesting place to go to, and then asked for missions to go to Pluto. Um, and so these thirty missions competed, and then it was uh, there were two missions which were which were selected for further study. And these two missions had a competition. And then finally, of these two, then uh, New Horizons was the one that was selected to actually fly. And this is how a lot of NASA's missions work, that the, the mission is funded by NASA, but it's not actually operated by NASA. It's operated by uh, Southwest Research Institute, the Johns Hopkins University. So those were found to be the best places to run this mission in this competition. And they were given the money by NASA to, uh, to develop and build and operate the mission. The other question is, is there a greeting card? Yes, there are some things that we put on board. Uh, there's actually a posted stamp, a US postal stamp that has a picture of Pluto on it, which is uh, uh, kind of famous because uh, we've we'd taken pictures of all the other planets before with spacecraft. But uh, when the stamp was made, it was just an artist drawing of Pluto. So we put that on there just to show Pluto what it, uh, what it looked like uh, from the artist drawing back in the 1990s when this Postal Service stamp came out originally. Uh, there's um, ashes from, uh, uh, I believe it's ashes of Clyde Tombaugh, uh, who is this uh, discoverer of Pluto, which went along on the mission. So uh, he himself has actually flown in space past Pluto, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, um, let's see what, and there is, there's a, uh, I believe there's a DVD with um, uh, names and messages from Earth. It's not as complicated as the as the Golden Record, which uh, is associated with the Voyager and or the Pioneer missions. But uh, there are some goodies like that on the mission. Okay, I think we'll have to uh, stop here, Henry, because of the time limit. There are still a few more questions which are pending, uh, but maybe we can email you those questions. Uh, of, course. of course. Yeah. Uh, before we end, let me tell you that uh, your talk uh, is heard by people across the India, people as far as from Bombay to uh, Orissa and from Punjab right to the uh, southern part of India. You also have a few people who have joined us from UK and from uh, US. So it was really received by uh, wide uh, people from um, uh, geographically very wide regions and uh, we had about uh, 140 participants from Zoom group as well as uh, from uh, YouTube group. So uh, let me thank you on behalf of Kabul Mandal and on behalf of all the participants for the wonderful talk. It was really great to hear you about the New Horizons mission and hope sometime in future we can once again have an opportunity to hear you speak about more exciting things. And I thank the uh, participants um, for uh, their uh, enthusiasm in asking the questions and listening to the talk. Uh, uh, Henry, do you want to say anything? Thank you, Sujata. Thank you, Abhay. Thank you, all of Kagal Mandal, for this uh, invitation for having me here. I hope to come uh, back and uh, talk with you again in person. Uh, I love India, and I, uh, I'm sure that I will be back. And I and I look forward to uh, to meeting with all of you again in person. So thank you so much for the wonderful questions. Uh, thank you for the wonderful day, and uh, best wishes to all of you. Okay, thanks a lot, Henry. Uh, before we end, let me thank my team of Khagol Mandal, Samir, Abhay, uh, who are uh, working tirelessly to keep these two platforms going on without any problem. So uh, for everyone, let us meet, end the meeting here. Uh, and all of you have a safe stay at home and good night and good day to Henry. <laughs>